that if you ever learned about the atom, you probably learned Bohr's model in middle school, in a middle school class. So what we're going to do today is we are going to talk about Bohr's model, and then we're just going to hint as to how it's changed and why it's changed just by looking at two other scientists, okay? One by the name of de Broglie, who came a little bit, his uh, model came, or, or his refuting of Bohr's model came a little bit after, and same thing with Heisenberg, who a lot of you have probably heard the name Heisenberg from Breaking Bad. Anybody that watched Breaking Bad? Okay, and his name is, he was actually named after the Heisenberg that we're going to talk about, so I'll explain why very briefly, okay? So we're going to talk about this Bohr model of the atom, and it basically talks about how the electrons spin around the nucleus like planets around the sun. We don't look at it that way anymore, but his model still has some really, really, really good ideas, and we still believe a lot of the stuff that um, he came up with between him and Einstein and some of the other scientists of that time. Okay. So we're in the notes, and it says very important, important information about the model of the atom came from the early 1900s. Remember J.J. Thompson's plum pudding model, which is kind of like the chocolate chip cookie? And we said that it was positive charge. What were the chocolate chips? Electrons. electrons. So he's actually given credit for discovering the electrons. And then Rutherford, he's the one that shot the alpha particles at the gold foil, and most of them were supposed to go through, but every once in a while they bounce back, because he's the one that's given credit for finding the nucleus. nucleus, that there was a dense nucleus. Awesome. Another important discovery was that electrons, which were thought to be particles, actually have a wavelength. And so that means that both energy, matter and energy, are not totally separate from one another. So all matter exhibits particle-like and wave-like properties. So we're going to talk a little bit about that spec demo that we did. So I'm just going to draw the glasses on here real quick so that we know what we're talking about. So here are my, here's my real quick drawing of the spec glasses. So another important experiment was the study of the emission of light. And you need to know this also for the quiz. So the excited hydrogen atoms. Remember what happens is they intake the sugar. The little kid intakes the sugar and they go on the sugar high. But if we're talking about atoms, we're going to say that the atoms will end up intaking, you provide, you supply the electricity, and so they intake the energy, and the electrons become what? Excited. Excited. Awesome. They jump up to higher levels, and then they're unstable there, so what happens? They, they fall, out. and they release the energy. So it says, a sample of hydrogen gas receives a spark of energy, that's the electricity, and the hydrogen molecules absorb the energy, exciting the hydrogen atoms. Exciting the hydrogen atoms. So the electron jumps. It does not slide. It jumps in packets. What do we call those packets? Quanta. Nice. Quanta, if it's plural, in quanta, to higher energy levels. As they return, energy is released in the form of radiation. What kind of radiation? Electromagnetic radiation. Very good. In this case, as we see it, so it's as visible light. Nice. Okay, so we're going to talk about Bohr. So he was a Danish physicist, and he develops what is called the planetary model of 1913. And his model, you know, remember how we said, so he's Rutherford's student. There was a problem with Rutherford's model, and even Rutherford knew there was a problem with it, because if you had a positive nucleus, and then there, there's a dense nucleus, and there are electrons that, surrounding, that are surrounding, What's wrong with that? What was the problem that everyone was having at the time? Yes, you can just say it. They would attract. They would collapse right in. And so everyone, including Rutherford, said, we need to figure this out. So Bohr's his student, and Bohr goes, I got it. It's like planets around the sun. And the planets are not collapsing into the sun because they're staying in, in orbit. He said it's the same thing. These electrons are actually staying in orbit. Now again, we look at it a little bit differently, but this whole idea of being confined to certain energy levels, we still today believe the same thing, okay? So as a student of Rutherford, he proposed that electrons are arranged in concentric circular paths around the nucleus, like planets orbiting the sun. Like planets orbiting the sun. Each with a different energy level. So what are these energy levels? These are described as a ladder where the lowest strong is actually the lowest energy level. Everyone say 
N for energy level. N for energy level. Okay, this N is different from the N in nanometers. The reason why is that has to have, it has to be like NM nanometers or NG nanograms or NS nanoseconds. This is just N alone. So if it's not N something, then they're talking about energy levels. The lone electron of a hydrogen atom is in the lowest energy level, and we call that ground state. And ground state is when n is equal to 1, not 0. So similar to you getting on a ladder, you wouldn't call the lowest step the zero step. You would call it the first step. Awesome. So um, a quantum of energy, Quantum Leap used to be a show that um, was really popular. There's a TV series. They show like reruns of it now. But um, it's a time travel type of show. So quantum leap is simply an abrupt change. It's an abrupt change. So it's the amount of energy to move an electron from its present energy level to the next higher level by the addition of outside energy, which we talked about a little bit before. The higher an electron is and the further from the nucleus it is, the more energy that it has. The energy levels are not equally spaced, though. They're not equally spaced. Like an escalator, you know when you get to the top of an escalator, what starts happening to the steps? They start getting closer and closer together, right? And then you can step off so the steps get closer together. So like an escalator, the higher up, the higher you get, the closer the levels. The closer the levels. Okay, so let's talk about this quantum idea real quick before we move on. So uh, we could use instruments. I'm going to use cars instead. In quantum mechanics, there's no in-between. There's no slide. You hit one, that's the energy that you have, and then there's going to be a jump in energy. So let's talk about a car instead, what a quantum car would be like. There is no quantum car that exists. Every single car that we have on Earth would be called a classical car. So whether you have a really fast car or a really slow car. So think about any car in your head, okay? You push on the gas, and what happens? You start to accelerate. And you're going to go from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5. It slides. Some cars slide much faster. And within 6 seconds, you're at 60 miles per hour, okay? And other cars take longer for that to happen. But you're sliding into it. On the quantum car, what would happen is you would have a button. This would be a button. And the button might say 60 mph miles per hour. Or maybe the button says 200 mph. And what is going to happen is you're going to push the button and you're going to wait. And the energy, it's going to gain energy, gain energy. It has to gain energy from somewhere, okay? So you have to supply the energy from somewhere. The car is not going to move until, bam, all of a sudden you jump and you're going 200. There is no in-between. There is no acceleration. It's, bam, you're going 200. That's what a quantum car would be like. So maybe in the future we'll get to that point, okay? But as for now, we're, it's all classical. So why am I saying this? The idea is you have packets of energy. When energy is being absorbed and when energy is being released, it does not slide. There's actually a jump to the next level or a jump back down where energy is released. So if you're moving out away, then you're gaining energy and absorbing it. Otherwise, energy is being lost and released. And then it comes out in different forms of radiation. Okay? So it says, adding outside energy causes the excitation of an electron, raising it to an excited state. We already said that. It's going to raise it to a higher energy level or an excited state. And um, when the electron eventually drops back down from its unstable excited state back to ground state or just to a lower level, some energy is emitted as a photon. So what is this photon? It's the same thing as a quantum of energy, except it's in a stream. So it's a packet of energy in a stream. That's all it is. And this was proposed by Einstein. That's all the photon is. So. Because, and we'll talk about a photon gun when, it, when we talk about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So because of quantized energy, the electron must release discrete amounts of energy as, what do we say, how is it going to release the energy? As different radiation, as electromagnetic radiation. Each electron releases energy at a specific frequency or wavelength. I heard wavelength. Because C equals lambda times nu, you can have either one. So the most important equation to come from Bohr's model 
is this crazy madness. It looks like crazy madness, but it's actually really simple. So let's break yeah. this equation down. Now the thing with Bohr's model is it only works for hydrogen, all right? It only works for the hydrogen atom, and we'll talk about after, why is it that we still use it if it only works for hydrogen? So we'll talk about that. What do you think this E is for? Energy. Energy, Energy. awesome. What do you think this N is for when we defined N up there? What do we call it? Energy. Energy level. Awesome. This is the, and put N in quotes. So it's the energy level and put that in quotes. And this N is also for energy level. That N is also there. Now, it's this negative 2.18. In your calculator, you would write it as E negative 18. Remember, no times 10, no times, just E negative 18. And then there's this joules, which are the units of energy. Then there's this crazy z squared business. But the problem is, if we're only using this for hydrogen, then the nuclear charge of it is going to be 1. And if you square, what's 1 squared? 1. So we can actually ignore it. You don't have to worry about z. Because if we're only using this for hydrogen, then that's equal to 1. So we're just going to say 1 squared is 1. So what this equation really becomes is this number over and over again divided by some energy level squared. And if it's two squared, what would that be? Four. Divided by four. What if it's five squared? 25. Divided by 25. If it's seven squared, you would divide it by? 49. 49. Okay, so it's just that number squared. Um, what I'm gonna tell you is in your calculator, we're gonna do a whole bunch of these right now. There is a faster way. If you um, arrow back on most calculators, you can arrow back up to the problem you did before. So once you type it in once, and instead of dividing by 4, you can just delete the 4 and make it a 6, or make it a 9. Delete the 9, make it a 25, depending on what you're dividing by. So just to speed up your calculations. So let's try this. It says that we want to calculate the energy, the electronic transitions, for the energy of an electron from 1 to 5. Before we do that, let's draw Bohr's model real quick. We're going to draw a nucleus. And then around the nucleus, we're going to draw some energy levels. So we're going to draw the first one. Bless you. That's our first energy level. The second one's a little bit closer, okay? So it's not as far as the first one. The third one is going to be even closer. So this would be our third energy level. And then I'm going to do the fourth energy level really close to my, oops. My fourth energy level is going to be really close. So just right in the margin there. And then we're going to call this one, two, three, and four. So these are going to be the levels, the energy levels of these electrons in Bohr's model. So instead of drawing it that way on here, I just did lines and that way we can do the calculation, but it would be like the nucleus is down in the middle here. So this would be representing the nucleus and then this is going to be the first level, the second level, the third level, like runs of a ladder, okay? Moving out from the nucleus or up or depend because your nucleus is in the middle, so it could really technically be going down. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to calculate using this equation for E1 to E5. So let's start down here and E1. Okay, let's use the equation. If N is 1, then all we're going to do is we're going to do negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules divided by what? 1 squared, which 1 squared is just 1. So what's your answer? The same thing. Awesome. You don't have to put it in your calculator. Negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. Done. Let's try number 2. E2 equals. Okay, now we're going to take the same number. Negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. And then I'm just going to go across, um, let's go across the first, the front row. Okay? So, um, what would you be dividing by if it's E2? What bottom number are you dividing by? Four. Good, because? Two squared. Two squared is the same thing as four. Okay? So go ahead and divide this, and then if you can tell me what you get in your calculator once you divide it. Um, negative 5.45 times 10 to the negative 19. Awesome. Negative 5.45 times 10 to the negative 19, and we've got joules. Um, negative 8.72 times 10 to the negative 20. Nice. Negative 20 now. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. So what we're doing here, and I'm going to tell you that we're going to see what happens when the electron falls between levels, though. And so what we're going to need is the change in energy between two levels. 
So we're either going to go from 1 to 3, or 3 to 1, or 5 to 2, or 2 to 5. The difference is the same. The only difference between them, between the differences, is your sign. Either it's positive or it's negative. So, if your electron is absorbing energy, that means it's moving away from the nucleus. So if your electron is moving up, that's my E, then it's absorbing energy. We have to supply some kind of electricity or something that is going to supply this atom with energy. So absorbing energy, this would be positive. Okay? If your electron is falling, oh, it's actually releasing energy. And now your sign would be negative. So this is the electron falling. Okay, and just from the electron falling, that's how we get radiation, different forms of radiation. So if we can calculate where the electron is falling from and to, then we can figure out what kind of radiation it is. And that's what this problem is going to ask us. Okay, so it says, calculate the energy, the frequency, and the wavelength of light released, released when an electron falls from fourth energy level to the second energy level. Imagine none of this above this problem were there. Just focus on the problem for a second. What's wrong with this problem? There are no numbers. The only thing they're giving you is four to two. That's all they're giving you, okay? So on your, um, in your quantum pack, so I had said that numbers eight and nine were new. You have to use the negative 2.18 equation, Bohr's equation, okay? So you're going to have to figure out the energy at each one first, like we did here, and then you can solve for it. So let's start. First of all, we're going to do three parts. We're going to do the energy, the frequency, and the wavelength. So just make sure that you have a little bit of space. You might want to write a little bit smaller. Let's start with the energy, but it's change in energy. If we want the change in energy, similar to you're figuring out how much money you have in, in the bank, you always do final minus initial. So we're going to do EF, meaning E final, minus EI, meaning initial. So E final minus E initial. Here's our final point that our electron is. Not our original, but our final. The second energy level. So our final is going to be 2, and what's our initial? 4. It says that we start at the 4th and we end at the 2nd. I'm going to tell you that if you do it backwards, you're still fine. Your sign will just be opposite. So if your electron's going up, then it's positive. If your electron's going down, it's negative. So you can always check your answer and change it if you did it incorrectly, okay? So what is our energy at the second level? Times 10 to the negative 19. Now you want the difference, so you're gonna subtract, and you're gonna minus E4. And what is it at E4? Negative 1.36 times 10 to the negative 19. Jules. Okay, go ahead and plug this into your calculator. Negative 4.09 E negative 19. Nice. And this is in joules. So this is my E. Even though it's a change in E, it's still your E. That's your energy. Okay? So now we're done with our E. Now we need to figure out our frequency. Here we go. This is old stuff now. This will be what, you, what you're expected to do on your quiz. If you know your energy, how do you find your frequency? E equals H nu, but we're solving for nu, so nu is equal to E over H. Awesome. So again, because E is equal to H times nu, you have to divide by H on both sides to get nu alone. Okay? So let's plug this in. Nu is equal to, oh, by the way, it's absolute value. Frequency and wavelength do not have negatives. Energy has negatives because positive means it's absorbing and negative means it's releasing energy. That's the only reason why E has a sign. Wavelength and frequency don't. So what does absolute value mean? It's all positive, no negatives, all positive, okay? So nu is equal to E. Here's our E right here, negative 4.09 times 10 to the negative 19 joules divided by H. Good, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34J times S. You don't have to memorize that, okay? That will be given to you on the quiz. All right, so now 
what is nu equal to? You're just going to divide in your calculator. Don't forget absolute value, so no sign. 6.17 times 10 to the 14. Awesome. And my joules cancel out, and I'm left with 1 over seconds, which again is the same thing as hertz. Perfect. Now they want us to calculate lambda, wavelength. There's a really easy way to do it. What would you do? Lambda is equal to? C over nu. Perfect. Because we have nu, we can do C over nu. Otherwise, you can do lambda equals what? HC over E, but that takes longer. You can use that E over there. It just takes longer, so it's easier to just do this one. So lambda equals C, what's C? 3.00 times 78 meters per second divided by our frequency, which we just found here, 6.17 times 10 to the 14th inverse seconds, 1 over seconds, and... 4.86 times 10 to the negative 7. That sounds right. 4.86 times 10 to the negative 7. Our seconds, inverse seconds, cancel out, and we're left with meters. Now, the last question says, what kind of radiation is emitted? Now, I want you to go back to the first page. It says that the wavelength is at 10 to the negative 7 meters. Everybody flip back to the front, look at your wave. It gives you wavelength. Where on this does it match? Yes, 10 to the negative 7 actually matches up with visible light. Actually, visible light. Okay. Um, and you wouldn't have to you wouldn't have to do that unless um, I give you a chart. I would give you a chart. You don't have to have those memorized. Okay. Last thing. Real quick, De Broglie. Okay. So De Broglie, we're gonna come back to this later. De Broglie was a French grad student, and he asked if light behaves as waves and particles, and does everything behave as waves? That's basically what his question was. And guess what he found out? Yes. 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 All matter exhibits wave-like motion. So the question is, then why is it that everything doesn't look like it's moving in wave-like motion? And what he said was, if the mass is too big, this is the mass down here, so this is M for mass. What do you think the V is for? It's not frequency, it's in meters per second. Velocity, awesome. What's this H? Who's constant? It starts with a P. Planck's constant, that's Planck's constant. Now you won't have to solve these problems, you just need to know how it works a little bit just to get conceptually get the idea of it. So this is wavelength, okay? And then we have H over MV. If this number gets bigger, so let's say your numerator is a 10 and there's some number in the denominator. As this number goes from 2 to 5 to 11 to 25 to 100, what happens to your wavelength? It gets smaller. So the bigger your mass, the smaller the wavelength. And here's the idea. If you had a strobe light, has, how many of you have been in a room with a strobe light in there? And you could stop movement and just see how people are moving. You could take snapshots of it. It looks like everybody's moving in wave-like motion. So you could be walking and and there's music playing. And instead what it looks like is but really you're just doing this, right? Does it look like people are moving in wave-like motion when the strobe light's flashing? So the idea was if you could slow it down, if you could stop it, then everyone looks like they're moving in waves. It's just that things that are visible to the eye, their wavelength is so very small that we can't actually see it. Okay? All right, and then we'll talk more about this um, at the next lecture. And that's it for Moore's model of the atom. Okay.